Next item of business is the highlight of today's meeting, the administrative report to be presented by President Barchi. This will be followed by uh, a period in which President Barchi has agreed to answer questions. Immediately following his report, I'll explain the procedures for the question period. But first, the Chair welcomes and recognises Rugby's President Robert L. Barchi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to a new academic year. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm delighted to have the conversation with as many as we can. I can't easily see over my shoulder, so I'm going to hope that our camera keeps up with me here. Let me just start off before we get into my comments with a word. Um, of recognition and appreciation to our colleague Jan Ellen Lewis. Um, I know that many of you in this room knew Jan well. I've only been here now in my seventh year. Um, many of you have known her uh, for more than 40 years of her time here at Rutgers. Uh, she was a friend and a colleague, <clears throat> as you know, a member of the faculty for 41 years, uh, dean of the School of Arts and Sciences in Newark since uh, 2013. Um, she was a distinguished historian of colonial America uh, with um, an emphasis on gender, race, and politics in that setting, nationally involved in the endowment for the humanities and many other um, uh, areas that support the humanities, and I know um, that she will be missed by us all. I just want to let you know that um, Chancellor Cantor is organizing um, a, um, uh, an event to celebrate uh, her life and her contributions uh, a little later on in the fall, we'll keep you informed about um, that as the time comes nearer. But let me move now on to the topic of the conversation. Um, that is basically a look back on Rutgers during the past year. Um, this really has been a year of ups and downs, of challenges and milestones. Um, some things you know we've had a record number of graduations, a record number of new students. Our fundraising has reached an all-time record, middle states accreditation, unprecedented jumps in our ranking. But we've also had challenges to free speech and academic freedom on this campus, uh, and we face continued financial constraints. So I'm going to try to touch on the highlights of those things. Obviously, in the time that I have, I can't go into depth in all of them. But they're all covered in my detailed report, uh, which is posted online, as well as the, um, the uh, slides that I will have here, which also will be posted online. So let me just run forward for a second and <clears throat> talk a little bit about where we are today. What's changed and what's not changed? Where are we today? Let's just set the stage for what happened in the past year. If you look back in 2012, for me, that's when I got here, that's when I put my stake in the ground, and I kind of refer back to that. We had about 58,000 students at Rutgers. We're now roughly 70,000 students. Uh, in 2012, we conferred about 14,000 degrees. Uh, we were over 18,000 uh, at our commencements across the university last year. The budget in 2012 was about $1.9 billion. Um, in the current fiscal year, it's $4.3 billion. Um, our endowment was about 690 million in 2012. Now it's about 1.3 billion. Some of that obviously is rebound of uh, the markets, but we have moved up significantly in our ranking in endowments, all of whom follow the same market trend. So we are making progress uh, in building that valuable asset, although we still are near the bottom of our peer group with, uh, with, uh, in terms of our endowment. Uh, we have made significant progress in endowed professorships from uh, 41 to now 88, and I hope we can see a significant rise in that. We are so under-endowed for our senior faculty on this campus that um, it's an uphill climb. Um, we really, really have to get on top of that with our fundraising. And we've been working on that, and I'll show you in a minute that our annual fundraising has significantly increased, as has our research funding. Um, particularly pleased that in spite of all the financial constraints, uh, the compound annual growth rate of tuition here during the five years prior to 2012 was about 
Um, in the last year, since 2013 to 18, it's been 2.3 percent. Uh, at the same time, we've been able to see capital construction for education and research and faculty initiatives um, go from something around $800 million during the five years before 2012 to well over $2.2 billion uh, in the last uh, five years. And of course, in 2012, we had no Rutgers Health. Um, in the past academic year, uh, Rutgers Health saw over 2 million uh, patient visits. But if I have to look back on the past year and ask what really were the dominant questions, I would have to say that they were social questions. We were faced with social issues that overshadowed many of the complicated financial and academic issues that we have to face on this campus. Issues of free speech and academic freedom, issues of immigration and federal policies with um, regard to migration, um, and issues that have to do with promoting uh, diversity on the campus. Let's just start out with the free speech issue. And I've given you a quote here from um, Chemerinsky and Gilman, a little book that you should read if you haven't read it on free speech on campuses. It was published last year. <clears throat> very easy to read, very succinct uh, treatment of First Amendment and academic freedom. And the quote that they have there relates to the fact that inclusive learning environments must protect freedom of speech and that they may not treat the expression of ideas as a threat to the learning environment. You can't have an open learning environment unless you have free speech. And in a, in a correspondence that I recently had with the executive dean of our School of Arts and Sciences, I just reiterated that statement that I've made many times, that few values are as important to the university as the protection of our First Amendment rights. Um, we had some episodes last year uh, that we tried to deal with in an open um, and even-handed way, uh, asking members of the community to participate. Uh, some of the things that we did do, uh, we had a symposium that lasted for a very exciting day in March on fighting hate while preserving freedom, um, had <clears throat> speakers from around the country uh, addressing us, uh, Francine Rostin, Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, our attorney, attorney general here in New Jersey, um, Gerber Grewal, and a number of our own faculty and panels really coming to grips with hard issues. And I have to say, these are not issues for which there are single solutions. There are not necessarily right answers. You can't necessarily open the playbook and say, okay, here's the play, that's the hole we're running into. Each situation has to be assessed differently. They're very complicated situations that we deal with. Because of that, and because of new issues that have come up over the summer, I have elected to put together an advisory panel that will advise our Office of General Counsel on issues that relate to the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And um, it is composed of absolutely world-class faculty from this institution who have broad and deep experience in First Amendment um, and academic freedom issues. Ron Chen, John Farmer, Stacy Hawkins, Barbara Lee, uh, and Ray Solomon. Um, understand that these faculty members are doing this um, at our request, but um, on their own volunteer time. This is not exactly the kind of thing that you take on lightly. There are almost certainly going to be people who agree with you and people who don't agree with you. Um, they have agreed, of course, to make their names public because that's the kind of an institution we are. Uh, but we will debate these issues when they come up we're always weighing and balancing uh, our commitment to First Amendment rights and free speech against the uh, demands of an institution for its own ability to carry out its business. And believe me, we will come down um, to the extent that we are able uh, on the side of protecting free speech. Let me move now to talk about DACA. I know that's a topic on everyone's mind. It's one we spent a lot of time on last year. Um, and um, I can't say it better than in the statement that we made in support of the uh, uh, New Jersey motion to intervene in the state of Texas versus the United States of America. Uh, we put in a brief, you know, we have been very vocal on a national level in support of DACA uh, and in support of individuals who are disadvantaged by some of the things that have been happening um, in Washington. Um, and we make very forcefully the statement that DACA students contribute to Rutgers goals of inclusiveness, diversity, and a cohesive culture. 
Um, the other point that we make that I think is very important to keep in mind is that diversity is not passive. It's not something you sit back and wait to happen. It's an actively created condition for inclusion, respect, equality, and fairness. So what does that mean? It means that we all have to be involved in creating diversity. We all have to be involved in supporting diversity. We all have to be involved in debating it, even though we all don't agree on exactly how we get there. Can't be passive. Can't sit this one out. We all have to be there talking about it. Some of the things that our community has done, I'm very, very proud of. You know we've generated 45,000 and some odd letters to our uh, Congress, and many of them in support of DACA, but because we are inclusive, we will forward any letters, whether they're in support of or against DACA, um, to the appropriate legislators by the same mechanism. Um, we have um, established the Immigrant Community Assistance Program, uh, which has individuals full-time who are there to help uh, our DACA students. Um, you know that Esther Chung was invited by Congressman Pallone to be at the State of the Union address and was very prominently featured there with TV shots. Um, we were able to work with the new Governor Murphy to be sure that tuition assistant grants, the TAG grants, um, were able to be secured for our dreamers as well as for the rest of our students. Uh, I just told you that we have a declaration in support of the, the case uh, from New Jersey and uh, Texas. Um, and another point I want to make is that Nancy Cantor, our chancellor in Newark, um, is co-chair of the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration. And notice that, not a typo, it's not the President apostrophe S, yes, it's the President's apostrophe, just so we understand who owns this particular alliance. The current status, as far as I know it, is that um, because of the Supreme Court decisions and postponements, that renewals and new applications for DACA must be accepted and processed. So we were doing this, we we're forwarding them to the government. Um, there will certainly be a Supreme Court review. That review will probably not happen, I don't think it could possibly happen before the late spring. It may not be until the following year. So between now and the late spring, nothing's gonna happen. Things may heat up again in the spring, uh, and we are going to be right there front and center if they do. The area where we're having more trouble is the area of travel restrictions. And as you know, there have been visa restrictions for seven countries. We have about 80 postdocs and grad students that have been affected by this, maybe seven or eight who are stuck in the administrative, um, uh, well, mall, I guess you would say, somewhere between here and Washington. Um, what we are doing is that we have uh, Rutgers Global Advisors working with each one of them directly. Um, we're working with them to try to provide ways to get them here if they need to come home. Um, we are working with ways to provide them with financial assistance if they need it. And of course, we continue to be very strong in our lobbying um, and other things that we can do to try to um, gain some um, leverage and some help for these individuals. Another area when we talk about diversity is, is staff and faculty diversity. And we've pushed hard with student, and I'll come up to that in a minute, and staff diversity. Um, faculty diversity remains a continuing issue for me. Uh, we made a commitment of about $22 million uh, to hiring, recruiting, and retaining diverse faculty members. And I'm pleased to say that last year, 40% of our tenured or tenure track appointments to the faculty were made to faculty who self-identified as being from underrepresented groups. Now you'd think that was fantastic, but there are a couple of problems here. First of all, we don't hire that many faculty members every year, and we have a lot of faculty. So when you're trying to move the, the ratio, it takes a while for that to have impact. But there are other things that are making it difficult for us to do. We cannot mandate, that is the administration, cannot mandate the hiring of minority faculty. That is illegal. What we can do is to try to make sure that the hiring process is fair um, and it represents the appropriate pool of candidates who are out there. That is to say, the search committee looks like the kind of population you're searching, that the candidate pool looks like the diversity mix of the postdocs and graduates coming out of that field three or four years before, um, and that the final candidate pool reflects that. We can't do that unless we have an organized way of processing applications. We have that. We, 
we have a, uh, a process in place, but we're having difficulty in having uh, the departments and the department administrators use that system. So if you have any push with your units, getting them to process through the system will help us to do that. And secondly, um, we have a, a difficulty in that more and more of our applicants are not identifying themselves demographically. Um, so they just simply are opting not to identify themselves and we don't know um, where they fit in that picture. What we are doing is providing mentoring and supporting a diverse faculty uh, because we know that while we can recruit diverse faculty, uh, it's very difficult to keep them here because the other universities around us would desperately like to hire them away. So part of our challenge is in mentoring those faculty and seeing that they are promoted uh, and that they are retained. And we've done a number of things, I'll, we're not gonna go through them in detail here, um, that are directed at pairing new minority faculty with other faculty across the university and providing them leadership training and leadership opportunities um, and for um, helping to ensure their success. And about 100 of our faculty members are participating in these faculty uh, efforts just in the past year. And of course, in our student enrollment, uh, we look at that um, very carefully. And I'm pleased to say um, that uh, we have a very diverse undergraduate and graduate population. About two-thirds of our students in Camden uh, are coming in as either black or Hispanic. In Newark, there was a 59% increase in enrollment among Newark residents. And that's part of Nancy Cantor's City of Learning Collaborative. Uh, but it's a major effort to make sure that the citizens uh, of that city are represented in the population of our scholars. And I'm I'm delighted to say that our Rutgers Future Scholars Program uh, leads the Big Ten in its graduation rates for students receiving Pell Grants. Um, I'm going to show you on the next slide something that you should be proud of. Um, when we talk about being committed to a diverse population and being committed to access and affordability, this is what we're talking about. Um, when you look at the gap between our Pell Grant students and our non-Pell Grant students in terms of their graduation rate, um, it is 5%. That is the lowest, the lowest in the entire Big Ten, and one of the lowest in the country. So we are doing very, very well in terms of ensuring that our minority students actually do graduate and that we give them what we said we would give them. It's not just a matter of getting them into school. That's not enough. It's getting them out of school. If you can't get them graduated with a degree, you haven't necessarily done them any favors. You've left them in a position where they may have debt and no way to take care of that debt. Next, I want to mention the fact that we are pushing forward with the Paul Robeson Plaza. Uh, we had a groundbreaking for that in the um, just last week. Uh, we'll be completing that construction uh, near Florida Paul, excuse me, later this year. Um, and we have looked at a number of buildings around the university to recognize this individual. And, and as I said in my comments there, there's, there are things about Paul Robeson that we really need to emphasize. This is somebody who had incredible talent in athletics, in uh, scholarship, uh, and in so many different areas in the arts. And he chose to do what I have implored our students to do every time we have a graduation. That is, don't just go out and make a buck, go out and make a difference. He committed his life to activism, to changing the activities of what's happening around the country, and to doing it in an orderly way, unlike some of our colleagues in the back of the room here. The next one I'd like to point out is the Middle States accreditation. You know, we're looked at by Middle States um, every so many years, and we operate under Middle States approval. Uh, we had our big, major Middle States accreditation review last year, um, chaired by Barbara Lee and Ann Gould. Uh, and I want to thank them up front for the tremendous effort that they invested, <coughs> I'm sorry, in getting this, um, this uh, document, this six feet of documents together and orchestrating this visit. Uh, we had Eric Barron, the president of uh, Penn State, chair the visiting committee. They were here over a period of days. Um, they came away very impressed. Uh, we were fully accredited on every one of the pillars with not one single material finding. Um, of deficit anywhere. Um, and I would just refer you to what they said in their statement. Um, they commended us for 
living a deeper mission than our focus on excellence in teaching, research, and service. Our focus on affordability and accessibility across geography and economic, ethnic, and racial differences is noteworthy. I've been on a lot of middle states reviews, both leading them and participating in them, and I've not seen a university come across quite this well. So I congratulate you as a faculty and a staff. I think you can be proud of your university and Barbara and Ann, I appreciate what you're doing. Of course, as I've said, you know, buildings uh, don't make great faculty and students. It's great faculty and students that make buildings. But we do need uh, facilities in which yeah, give us a yes. And I just wanted to announce uh, the openings of some of our new buildings this year. Uh, and I'm going to be back. The Camden, the Weeks Hall of Engineering in New Brunswick, the Life Sciences Center in Newark, Chemistry and Chemical Biology Building in, in New Brunswick, on Bush Campus, um, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy. And of course, we're, we're looking at the opening of the uh, honors living and learning community in Newark uh, and with the generous financial support from Barnabas Health, uh, the academic, the athletic performance center. The one I'm really happy about is a co-construction uh, with DevCo in the city of uh, New Brunswick for the Performing Arts Center. We really need this. Um, and this will add to the other performing arts venues in New Brunswick and it provides a home for the performing arts divisions of our Mason Gross School of the Arts. Now, I'd like to say we were doing all these things in a time of expansion, in a time of largesse, in a time of financial growth, but that's not the case. We have a lot of financial headwinds, uh, and before I go any further with those, I just want to make, with the rest of my comments, I want to run you through those quickly. Um, some of these things, uh, I think, are self-evident. Um, here's the, the first basic issue that all of us in higher education and state universities are dealing with. And that is that the cumulative higher education uh, index or the, the, uh, um, uh, the growth index has been going up dramatically over the past five years and the state appropriation has been flat or slightly down. And of course in inflation corrected dollars that means we've lost about 6% or 7% of our buying capacity over the last few years. And this is not a negative statement about the state. I think the state has helped us um, as much as they can in their difficult situation. It is a reality. Um, and I don't think it's prudent for us or any other university like us to expect that there's going to be a sudden rebound in state support that's going to make us whole. That's not happening. And so when we consider the fact that um, of our expenses, over 65% of them our personnel expenses, salaries and fringe benefits, and that our unionized personnel are well over 85% of our population here. You can see that we are in a path that is going to show continued escalation of underlying costs, and we're not going to see any help from the state. So we are looking for other ways to provide the dollars that will allow us to uh, provide our faculty and, and staff with the uh, wages that they are uh, that they deserve uh, and I'm going to go through a couple of those now but of course the first thing that comes up in my mind is what the impact of these things is on the tuition for our students we remain committed to accessibility and affordability for our students and everything that we've done has been targeted towards that and that includes the very narrow operating margins that we run under and the very very limited uh, net reserves that we keep in this university. Uh, and we've been able to do that. And I just want to point out that for the students in this university at any of our campuses who are among the, <coughs> excuse me, the most financially disadvantaged, these are for students whose family income is less than $48,000 a year. Um, in New Brunswick, after you deduct all the grants uh, from the various sources and our scholarships that they have available to them, their average tuition is $267. In Newark, they actually have $44 available beyond tuition to apply to other things, and in Camden, $132 to apply to other things. And obviously, we are in a university where we have a relatively high sticker price and a transfer um, to deductions for those who need it farther down the scale. But, I want to assure you that we remain absolutely committed to doing everything we can 
to making sure that the neediest of our students have access and are able to afford a Rutgers education. The other thing that we've been doing, of course, is working on philanthropy. Uh, when I got here, we were raising about $95 million a year. Um, we went up to a peak of $188 million when we closed out our $2 billion campaign. Uh, and after a slight drop, I've been proceeding up from there. Uh, this year, we raised $230 million. Uh, we project in the current year, we are setting as a target for our foundation $250 million. But understand that that's money that goes into an endowment which may help us years down the line. Doesn't necessarily help us today. And that's the problem. We need to really put money into the operating budget uh, which is where we need it because that's where it's getting spent. Um, I'll make some references to to the uh, <clears throat> what, how the external world sees us. Uh, we have had um, several bond rating sessions recently. Uh, the most recent in relation to our recent bond offering. Uh, and just to tell you that Standard and Poor's, remember we are we were two steps above the state in terms of our bond rating and the, the state was downgraded again. So there are very, very few state universities in the nation that are rated above their states. Because that's a bad place to start from. But with Standard & Poor's, um, they reaffirmed their global A1, I'm sorry, their global A plus and, uh, rating and changed us to a stable outlook, which was a major, major concession uh, given where the state is. And they noticed our found sound financial policies our favorable enrollment trends and our high student quality and graduation rates. Moody's reaffirmed their uh, AA3 rating, um, so we stayed firm there. Um, but both of those rating agencies in their reports, and I, they're public reports, so you're welcome to read them, identified two risks that we run. And I can tell you, we run them intentionally with the approval of our board. The first is a low level of net unrestricted net assets. We have the lowest percentage of unrestricted net assets as a function of our operating budget of any university in our peer group. We are by far the lowest in the Big Ten, not even close. That's where we are. And number two, we then couple that with a very narrow operating margin. We are looking about a 1% operating margin this year. Um, if everything goes well, we'll close with a 1% operating margin. So we are intentionally walking very, very close to the financial line. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because of what I said two slides ago. We're doing that because we are here to provide an education for our students. We are here to make sure that we have accessibility and affordability for our students. And we are here to be sure that any dollars that we have is not plowed into making our margins better, but is plowed into making those things possible for our students. Now let's talk about, I won't even comment on that one since those are paid for by donations to athletics, not by anything else. So let's talk for a minute about the, unit for, the unionized workforce. I know that's why so many of you are here cheering me on. We are in progress with negotiations, which is what makes this difficult. Let me point out that I so do delight in the give and take of academia here. We have had, let me just point out that we have had 87. which is part of our shared governance, and I hope you will allow me to do my job. We've held already 117 negotiating sessions, 87 sessions with staff units and 30 with the academic units. As you know, we've reached two settlements, one with the Teamsters and one with the FOP, and I anticipate that we'll see more settlements uh, in the near future. 
There are a couple of things that I want you to know, and those of you who are not union members may not know this, because it's not necessarily what you hear. First, although the terms of the prior contract have expired, union members are not working without a contract. Why not? Because our contract specifies that if we haven't ratified a new contract, the terms of the old contract continue. So they are totally protected by that term. The second thing that I want you to understand, let's, let's be sure we understand this, is that no members of our union will be financially disadvantaged by any delay because we are committed, as we have been in the past, that any settlement will be retroactive to July 1st. So that any settlement we have will be retroactive. Well, settle the case. Come on up and talk to us. Okay, so let me go on to, let me go on to. You know, Can I ask for order and civility, please? I have to assume that uh, those of you who are hollering are not senators, because if you were senators, you would have come to the microphone and asked to be recognized. If you're not senators, we're very happy to have you here, but the Senate is conducting its business, which right now is to hear the address of the President. There will be an opportunity, if you have questions, to ask them, and the sooner we let him finish his presentation, the sooner there'll be an opportunity to ask those questions. If you just came to jeer and mock, there are better places than this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me get on to the student experience, which is one of the things that we're all here for. And I want to mention a couple of areas where I think we've been working hard to improve the student experience, and I'm not going to be able to touch on them all, but let me run through a few of them for you. First is increasing financial aid for our students, and we've been very active in, in lobbying at the state level uh, for increasing our student uh, tuition assistance grants, the TAG grants. <clears throat> we were able to do that with a $7 million increase in TAG overall. We were also able to lobby for additional funding for EOF by $1.5 million. So um, every little bit helps. And an additional university action that I'm really, really pleased with is that our Board of Trustees dedicated income from the endowments that they control, $400,000 in 2018, to student financial aid areas. And that we will hear, I'm sure, at their next meeting in a week or so, um, their intentions for the next two years in terms of commitments of those, uh, of those dollars. And last year, recognizing uh, in my office that not everyone um, receives TAG grants and gets the benefit of these grants for the lowest, um, uh, 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 the most needy of our students, uh, we moved to increase the minimum wage for our student workers from eight and a half dollars to $11, and that $11 was a major commitment of dollars directly into our students' pockets. And I might just point out that although the governor has been very active in running on the basis of a $15 minimum wage, there is still nothing coming forward out of Trenton, and his plan, even if it were enacted today, would play out over the next five years. We did it last year. These are things that our students are getting right now. The other thing I want to point out to you is a Rutgers dashboard for students called My Rutgers. We're very interested in making accessible to our students all the areas that they need to address to make their lives easier um, in one site or one location. It's a way that gets around what I've heard when I came here called the Rutgers screw. I don't want to hear about that anymore. So we're doing that in a couple of ways. One way that we've already rolled out is the My Rutgers dashboard. And I assume that all, how many students are here, student members? Do you all have this on your, how many of you have it on your phones? Virtually everybody. So this one application, for those of you who don't know, provides in one place, on a phone or a computer, one-stop shopping uh, for the things that students need. Whether it's all the vital information that pertains to them specifically, they can register for class, they can pay bills, they can transact other university business. It is a single portal of entry, and it's gotten a tremendous amount of use. And what we can see is a, a commensurate decrease in the lines 
at registration every year that used to be out the door and around the corner, not there. So it's working, I think it's making it easier for our students um, and we'll continue to uh, optimize it as, as we move along. But the second thing is that we realize not everything can be handled by an app or by a phone. Sometimes you need to talk to somebody and we are committed to providing one-stop shopping for our students at our Student Services Center. Um, this will be for payments, for cashiering, financial aid, records, registration, anything you might want going to a single location to people who know what your problems might be and how to get your answers. We have um, a facility in Camden that already opened. Uh, we'll be opening a new one on the Bush campus uh, in the spring of 2020 um, and later that year another one um, in uh, Newark. Another area that we've been looking at since I got here uh, is the issue of course scheduling. Uh, it was talked about extensively during our strategic planning. Uh, we put together a task force back um, in um, the spring of 2015. <clears throat> they looked at systems that were available um, and have gone through a process of vetting. Um, they had a, a platform selection committee and have implemented it and we're now in the final stages of checking it out. So what we're doing this year is going through two cycles of shadow systems where we are doing all the scheduling for courses, the times of the courses, the locations of the courses, and all those things in parallel with the old paper system. So they're two completely independent but parallel. And with the help of our faculty and our staff, this will go live uh, for classes in next fall. So we'll be starting for the registration process for uh, courses that will be in place next fall. Uh, we continue to wrestle with the bus system. Um, I know for students who have just gotten to Rutgers, it's hard to believe that it was ever worse than this, um, but it actually was. Um, and uh, considering that we've added about 10% to our student body, um, I can tell you that we've reduced peak ridership on our buses by 10%. So given that swing there, it's actually a significant change. I, I don't know how many of you can feel that yet, but we're moving in the right direction. Uh, you know we operate the second largest bus fleet in the state. Um, we do about 60,000 bus rides a day. Um, what we've done so far since last year, we added 18 buses. Um, we have taken out the tandem buses. And the tandem buses seem like a good idea, but in fact, they didn't transport more people. They just blocked every intersection and everywhere we tried to get them off the main road. So got rid of those put in the 18 more buses. And incidentally, Tony tells me we're going green on this too and that uh, eventually we'll be with an electric fleet over a period of years. We're starting to make that transition. Um, and you know you probably have on your, on your phones now the bus tracking app so that you can tell exactly when the next bus is coming, where and where it's gonna go. Um, and I'm delighted to see when I got back um, to my office in September that the uh, bus shelter in front of the yard was finally in place. So. Uh, hopefully when the rain's coming down we can have a little more protection while we do wait for those bustles that seem like they never come. And one other area that I want to make you aware of, <clears throat> here again, something that you might not even see. We have gone from a paper system and a hang tag system for our parking um, to a completely paperless wireless system. Um, and as of, July, as of January there will be no more hang tags, no more hang tags. Everything will be done online. Um, you can apply for a visitor's pass online. Uh, the police car isn't there as an enforcer. It's just there because you see the little pods on the top of the roof? That car just drives through the parking lots, and we have now uh, an automatic optical license uh, recognition system that just reads all the license plates and knows who's there, when you're there, when you come and go. And hopefully by next year, we'll be able to get rid of the gates so that we can get cars in and out of the... Of the uh, of the parking lots and the object of the whole game is to reduce expenses. We're looking at everything we can to reduce expenses and make it more affordable uh, to our, our faculty and our staff. Let me move on now to scholarly excellence and what that means here. Um, obviously that's another reason why we are Rutgers and why we've been able to do what we do. Um, I'm just going to list on the on the screen, a few of our faculty honors. I don't have time to go through them all, but I do think it's worth noting that Paul Falkowski won the Taylor Prize this year for uh, the environmental achievements, which is 
widely recognized as being the Nobel Prize equivalent in this field. So I think that's a tremendous accomplishment. And as you can see, there are a whole list of faculty members who have won honors. Um, and we'd like to bring every one of them up here because they are what makes Rutgers great. The other thing that we've seen this year is, uh, I believe, a coming to fruition of our efforts to get people to focus on what we do in higher education. U.S. News and World Report this year changed their ranking system so that they place less emphasis on the old peer review. They used to put 25% of their weight on a survey that was sent out to all the presidents in the country that just asked, do you know this university and how do you rank them one to five? Which was a terrible way to do anything and didn't recognize anything about the outputs that universities have. They've moved now <clears throat> to reduce the emphasis on that peer ranking and increase emphasis on product, on output, graduation rate, uh, the rate at which your students graduate better than predicted, all the social factors that matter. If you're not doing those, the inputs don't make any difference. Doesn't matter if your uh, GPAs go up, although ours certainly have and our SATs go up, although ours certainly have. If those students aren't graduating, uh, and if your most uh, needy students are not graduating because they have to do other things, then you have not succeeded. And we have made a tremendous jump in the rankings this year uh, because of this new rankings. And let me just point them out to you if you didn't know this. Rutgers jumped from 69th in U.S. News and World Report to 56th nationally among research intensive universities and we're 25th among public universities. Rutgers New Brunswick moved from 133rd to 115 in national ranking. And Rutgers Camden, of course, remains about 25, 28, uh, where they have been in the regional rankings uh, all along. We have 28 academic programs that are ranked in the top 10 in their fields, <clears throat> excuse me, by US News and World Report or by USA Today. Um, Rutgers Newark is ranked number one in campus diversity and uh, we're ranked number four by Military Times as the best place for vets to go to college. And some er other areas of academics, um, I look at our research capabilities. Um, Rutgers now ranks among the top 20 uh, public universities in annual research expenditures. Uh, we've risen to over $600 million in research expenditures. You know we are far and away the largest we're larger than all other universities in New Jersey put together in terms of, that's both public and private, uh, in, terms of our, uh, in terms of our research expenditures. Um, the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, which is an NI, uh, NCI designated cancer center, was up for competitive renewal this year, a very, very competitive process. They came through with flying colors. They were redesignated as the only NCI designated comprehensive center in the state. Um, and with a budget that was virtually what they had asked for. Uh, out of our faculty research uh, and tech transfer, we were able to come up with 20 startup companies since 2014. Last year, we brought in uh, nearly $15 million in tech transfer revenue that's put back into our science. Uh, we established the Rutgers Corporate Engagement Center to bring together our faculty and our scientists uh, with corporations around the Delaware Valley who want to be involved who want to support our research or our faculty uh, or have projects that they want to do collaboratively. And we have started conversations with Princeton. I've met with Chris, uh, their president, and a number of their leaders, uh, and uh, our leadership continues those discussions to create a, a Rutgers-Princeton collaboratory, a Rutgers-Princeton corridor that will facilitate our, uh, our uh, activities in, in working together. I'm also very excited about what we've done in building our strengths in the humanities. You know that we had a task force several years ago, uh, and um, my concern was that with the emphasis on the STEMs and some of the other areas of growth, we did not lose sight of our strength in the humanities. And we put out about um, $10 million specifically to retain strength in the humanities in addition to diversity dollars, many of which were diverted into this area. And if I look at this past year, we had 20 new faculty hires in the humanities with renowned scholars in English and history, philosophy and linguistics, increased fellowship financial aid for master's candidates, uh, funding for graduate students in Camden. And I just point to two of our recent uh, recruits, 
um, Salamisha Tillett, who's the Clement Price Institute Associate Director uh, up in Newark, uh, and Naomi Klein, who's our inaugural uh, Gloria Steinem Chair here in New Brunswick, and who I believe is giving her inaugural address, uh, bad timing, but even as we speak, um, which um, is a tremendous asset uh, in addition to our university. Let me uh, move on now to other activities last year. Um, and we'll talk about the new state of health in New Jersey, uh, one that's received a tremendous amount of press, both locally and nationally. Uh, and um, this is the partnership between RBHS and R RWJ Barnabas Health that was signed in July. Um, the shared objective is to collaborate to form a world-class academic health system that functions as a single system uh, amongst the centers that we jointly are responsible for developing. The goals that we share together, that are very public, is to develop a world-class academic health system for New Jersey centered in Rutgers, to recruit active leadership in academic research and clinical faculty, um, consolidating our clinical care delivery under the RWJBH leadership and the academic and research uh, and educational aspects under Rutgers, uh, dedicating collective resources to build those enterprises and capitalizing on the strength of the Rutgers Health brand as this is rolled out nationally. And you have seen some of the commitments that Barnabas has made. Um, as you know, they have set aside $100 million in this first year for initiatives that will strengthen the academic health sciences entities in Rutgers, the academic health sciences entities in Rutgers. Those are committed dollars that are coming in over the course of the year. They've also set aside $10 million um, as loan payback for health sciences graduates who remain teaching in the system or delivering care in the system and in New Jersey. They've also committed to $50 million of support in the ongoing years for 20 years that will be committed to developing the academic health sciences enterprise uh, in Rutgers. And that um, is tied to the recruitment of at least 100 new faculty members in the next 10 years. Uh, and in addition to that, our clinical faculty will have the opportunity to, uh, to benefit from sharing a variable amount of the, of the profit margin, if you want some profit margin, of the, of the operating margin of the health system. So the more we succeed together, the more we can build our academic enterprise. What's equally important here is, is to know what is not happening. This is not a merger. This is not a sale. It is not a transfer of Rutgers employees to RWJB. Rutgers faculty and staff remain Rutgers faculty and staff, period. End of story. Right? End of story. There are no planned layoffs. In fact, it's just the opposite. We have every expectation of growing our clinical and research health sciences staff. And there are no benefits lost for our current Rutgers employees. We are going to celebrate this new entity, which I think is probably the biggest thing that's happened to Rutgers since the integration, uh, with an inaugural health sciences symposium on October 30th. Um, David Blumenthal, um, who is the former Sam Thier professor of medicine at Harvard, and the CIO of the Partners Healthcare System in Boston, one of the biggest in the nation, uh, is currently the president of the Commonwealth Fund, <clears throat> which provides, uh, provides support for healthcare policy and healthcare design will be the keynote speaker, and we have a list of uh, speakers and panelists that will make it a very exciting day. And moving on to another topic that I'm really excited about, <coughs> and that is the technology topic. This is something that we're doing uh, in conjunction with the state of New Jersey and the city of New Brunswick. And with the city of New Brunswick through DEVCO and Chris Palladino, who's been our partners in a number of other projects here uh, at Rutgers. It's a shared vision for using Rutgers as a driver for technology and tech transfer uh, in the innovation economy of the state um, and in working with DEVCO to design an incubator for technology for our faculty. So as we look at this space that DEVCO will be developing, we will work with them to create an environment uh, within that space that has university support, support, support services for tech transfer and innovation, um, incubator space for startups, new companies from you, our faculty, that are looking for places to grow, to make the transition 
from the last grant to the first tranche of investment, investment funding uh, from the major venture funds. Uh, we're looking at support services for core facilities and conferences and telephonic and IT services and partnerships with other institutions and with public uh, and private industry around the state that will be a benefit to our faculty and students who bring their intellectual property to that site. So I'm very excited about that. I think uh, you'll hear a lot more about that during the next year. Uh, there's much more I could discuss with you now. Uh, we haven't touched on administrative systems. We haven't talked about strategic planning update. There's so much more we could talk about. Um, I would refer you to the full report that I've posted uh, and hope you have a chance to read it. Uh, but before I do leave, I do want to say one last thing, and that's happy birthday, 100th anniversary for Douglas. As you know, Douglas began in 1918, and it was begun by the New Jersey Federation of Women's Clubs. Uh, Mabel Smith was the founding dean and led that organization for many years. Uh, the centennial celebration is this weekend, um, and uh, there will be a daytime colloquium and lots of other events to, uh, to celebrate. So our best wishes to Jackie Litt and to all the faculty and students and staff from Douglas for a 100th anniversary. I thank you very much, and you in the back have been very patient. Uh, and uh, I turn it back to the chair. Thank you, President Bocci. <laughs> this report is presented as part of our Senate business for the day, and President Bocci will now take questions from senators. <coughs> Initially, I plan to limit senators to no more than two questions each. When senators are finished asking their questions, and if time in our period permits, the executive committee has agreed that anyone else may, uh, may ask questions. More importantly, perhaps President Barty has agreed to answer them if possible. Senators may then ask additional questions if time permits, though I have to warn you that last year it didn't. This has long been a popular event and we do want to let everyone possible have their questions answered. Our procedures will be this. Please line up at one of the microphones. I will generally recognize questions from each microphone alternately. Please state your name and, assuming you're a senator, the constituency you represent. Uh, you can save time by not forcing me to remind you. <coughs> Please ask your question preferably in under a minute. There are other times and places better suited for berating the president or making speeches. The more succinctly you can state your questions, the more people have the opportunity to ask them, and the more time President Barty will have to answer them. Senators, on my left. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, President Barty. My name is Sasha Nicole Alexander Floyd, and uh, this is my first year as a senator uh, representing. <laughs> I have two quick questions regarding gender and race. Do you believe in equal pay for equal work for men and women? NTT and tenure track faculty, female faculty, earn less than their male counterparts. Only 20% of distinguished professors uh, who are uh, faculty are female. Only 30% are full professors. Wow. What will you do concretely, uh, not in terms of conferences, but what will you do concretely to level the playing field? And secondly, we have fewer African-American faculty today than the 1970s. Wow. Only 4.2% of tenure-track faculty are black. What do you intend to do about this? Um, are diversity and inclusion values uh, that matter to you? And specifically, are you willing to take the negotiation to keep faculty here out of the hands of simply um, the people who are ahead of a department? Uh, can there be some oversight of that? And I just want to say very quickly, but breaks my heart. I'm so glad. That okay, there's a there's a professor. There are two professors: a Latina professor and a black professor. One of whom had three book awards, um, and her situation was handled so badly. We need to make sure that we keep people here, so what concretely can we do to make sure that we value people at this university? Let me answer, let me answer your second question first. Um, I, I already showed you some of the things we're doing for, for faculty diversity. I absolutely agree with you. I think our, our um, African-American representation in our faculty is is, uh, is inexcusably low. Um, and we have provided resources to change that within the limits of what we can legally do. Uh, Barbara Lee, I'm gonna ask her to comment on this because she manages those things. Recognize that faculty hire faculty. 
and I cannot force faculty to hire a particular faculty member. All I can do is to provide the resources um, to make it possible for someone who might be less than uh, totally prepared to, uh, to would you allow me to finish please? To achieve success um, and to ensure that the process of uh, recruiting faculty is done with a level playing field with regard to minorities. And Barbara can talk to you about that. The second thing that we're doing Can't that we think is critical. That's like having the senators. Uh, okay, well, I'll be happy to. Uh, I'm just going to tell you again what I've already told you. The second thing that we're doing is providing mechanisms to educate um, and mentor faculty, minority faculty who are here, so that they can succeed in an environment like Rutgers, which is not always easy. Um, and as I said, we've had more than 100 faculty go through that process. And the third is that we do have a retention fund. And I would be happy for my senior vice president for academic affairs uh, to have those conversations with individual chairs and deans and chancellors, which I know she does on an ongoing basis, to make it possible for us to retain these people. Look, the, the last thing I want to do is to lose somebody that I've invested millions of dollars in hiring. That's only going to make us look worse for having lost. Now, I know that the best universities are coming out of rest faculty all the time. Um, but it, it certainly doesn't do us any good to lose them. So we have got the resources to help with that, um, but I can't force it to happen. And in, in regard to your first question, I think we've already made statements that we do believe that equal pay for equal work is, the, is where we should be. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an automatic across the board adjustment to all wages for all individuals based Why? on gender. Because that first you have to have the conversation about equal pay for equal work. I mean, once that conversation is had, then we can have the second one. But that's, so that's where we're going. I, absolutely, for equal work, there should be equal pay. I We've totally been having that, that conversation for decades. And the you last thing I would say- having it with me, ma'am. Senator, this is not a debate. Do you have the opportunity to ask two questions? There's a very large number of other people who want You're to ask right. their two questions too. You're right. I'm sorry, I'm one of the black faculty here. I was gonna to try to get a point between the half, but I'll, I'll let the other gentleman answer the question. You don't have to apologize. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for representing. Good afternoon, uh, President Barchi. My name is Fatma Taakabi. I'm a staff senator representing RBHS. Um, thank you for your report today. Uh, I am a proud uh, alumni of Rutgers, but I also stand in solidarity with my um, union uh, members here. <laughs> Um, with that being said, uh, you share the, uh, the millions of dollars that Barnabas Health uh, is providing with our merger with them. Uh, as a staff member working in RBHS, in particular at the School of Health Professions, we noticed this year that tuition rates had gone up significantly for our students, which impacted some of them being able to come to our program. My question is, how are these dollars that Barnabas is pouring into this academic health care system translating into the tuition burden for our students? Well, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, while I'm not trying to duck it, it doesn't come to me. It goes to RBHS. And we should ask Chancellor uh, Strong exactly the question you're asking. I, I certainly do not see our future put on the back of the tuition of our students. I've said that many times. And to the extent that I'm able to control it, uh, we don't see that happening. We, we see market rate tuitions, but we're trying the best we can to keep those tuitions down. So if there's a way that we can subsidize that process, um, I will certainly discuss it with Brian. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Troy Shabrat. I'm a uh, senator from the School of Engineering on, uh, on Bush campus. Um, I thought it was. Um, <laughs> I, I want to congratulate you on, on uh, your your contract to renew Hope or at, at Rutgers, um, and, and I want to address the, the, the obvious fact that there there is uh, considerable uh, anger in, in the crowd today, and, and the anger in the crowd, I think, is because uh, while you have a contract for a thirty. Increase in your salary. Um, 
I think the anger here is, is because we are working without a contract and, and we are assured of some retroactive amount perhaps in the future. Uh, but, but the fact is that the union called for discussions about the contract in December uh, concerning the contract that was going to end in, in July. The university did not begin conversations until March and they have dedicated less than eight hours per month to these contract discussions right. with a new yeah. contract yeah. And, and, and to me, to me, that just appears disrespectful. And I think that the anger that you are hearing is because of this disrespect. And therefore, my question is, what do you plan to do to reinvigorate these discussions so that we can all work with the contract? First of all, let me clarify some, uh, some misfacts. Um, I do not have a new contract. I do not have any increase in salary. Um, I have a contract which is open-ended. Basically, they can fire me any time, any time they want. And my salary today is the same salary that I had in the, in the, in the uh, spring. So I don't know where this 30% increase is coming from. You came but on with 600,000. You're now over 800,000. That's I'm right. sorry? You came on with 600,000, you're now over 800,000. That's where it came from. But the question that I, that I asked... I so the increase in salaries that I've received since I got here have been the same as you've received. So the, the increments have been... I've received the same increments that you've received. So, but let's, let's just get it straight. I do not have a new contract. I do not have a 30% raise for staying. I'll be happy to leave any time. Okay, I, I, you know, anytime the board wants me to step down, I'm out of here. Believe me. Can you address the question that I raised, so, please? Well, that, to me, that was one of the pressing issues because if we can't have accurate communication, we can't have communication. And, you know, I will ask my labor negotiators to increase the frequency with which they meet if you're committed to come to the table. Come to the table. I'd be delighted to do that. I think you'll... Thank, thank you. We will look forward to more than eight hours per month. Hi, uh, my name is Portland Curtis, and I am a senator representing RBHS School of Nursing. So uh, my question for you uh, goes about our students living with mental illness. I know that in this past you have spoken about how our services at CAPS do not serve the acuity and number of our students. Um, and you've been talking a bit today about our initiatives with health. You've also talked about our most needy students. What I have failed to see in my years here at Rutgers is more effort put towards these students, particularly the ones who have been hospitalized and have lost their housing at Rutgers University because of that hospitalization. Res Life does not refund the money that they lose when they have to leave campus because the student can't handle that care. I would like to see some type of program similar to that which we have for our sober living students that would support whether they're going to an IOP and also school part-time where that housing is meant for our students living with mental illness who are trying to recover and who are doing well at it and all of the students who are trying to recover and still struggling. I don't see a lot of work for these students, and we have a number of them, as you have recognized. So I want to know if we have any funding going towards some type of living community that will help these students, and what initiatives are being taken to help them get back into school, rather than taking their housing and putting them homeless on the streets. I, I, you know I consider this to be a very serious problem. Right. Uh, both from so do personal I. personal experience and from uh, the responsibilities that we have. Uh, it's a, it's a, a challenge that all of our higher education institutions are facing on an escalating level. Mm -hmm. uh, and we simply don't have the capacity to provide any more but the initial triage and acute intervention. I hope that with our partnership with Barnabas and our deep 
of penetration of the healthcare uh, environment in the state that we can find a way uh, through the uh, joint uh, care providers that we have to make that transition between what happens at CAPS and what happens in ongoing care uh, smoother than it is now, which is not good uh, and is a problem for us. And uh, we don't have on the books um, right now a new dorm, for example, that could accommodate that. Um, but, but we, we certainly put money should be towards sensitive. Honey to, I'm sorry? But we put our money towards Honeygrow and opening up all these new places on our campus that we don't need. Yeah, well, actually, those places are what pay for the other things. Right, but why are we building these places for those things when we can build places for our students and their living situations and their health needs? Yeah, I, I wish it were that simple. If it were, I would be doing it. Uh, I, I really understand the, the situation you're describing, and I would love to work with you to alleviate those aspects of it that we can. And again, I would like to work with you, things, too, on that, so please reach out to me I, then. I would expect that our, our my senior vice president for health affairs, who has responsibility across the university, uh, would be the one to whom I would look to address some of these issues. Uh, we obviously had uh, have added resources to CAPS, but that's only a band-aid. It's, really, it's not addressing the bigger problem that you're talking about. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator. Brunswick, um, representing within Student Affairs. Um, so my question is, Rutgers is, as you know, proud to work with incarcerated students and ex-offenders through programs like Mountain View Project and New Jersey STEP, but at the same time, University Human Resources has now instituted automatic pre-employment background checks for all new employees that could remove our own graduates from the employment pool. Uh, there's no transparent policy explaining what kinds of checks are actually being run on which candidates, whether it's criminal, civil, credit, social media, um, or the like. There's no explanation of what kind of findings will bar candidates from employment or jobs. Um, so my questions to you, um, Dr. Barchi, is what are you doing to ensure that checking backgrounds is only for legal required data like work authorization and professional licenses? Um, disclose what checks are run for what positions and what findings will actually bar candidates from jobs, um, and committing to not using simple marijuana possession convictions as a bar to employment, um, as well as what we provide employment opportunities to ex-offenders who have paid their debt to society. Yeah. Those, are, those are very reasonable questions and the ones that I have raised with human resources as we had to go forward with this. Uh, I would if I didn't lose my voice having to speak over, over your comments before, but I don't have any speech left here. Um, so the problem is that not having any background checks at all puts us in not even in the minority. We're not even on the map with what our peer groups do, and it exposes us tremendously from a liability point of view. As you pointed out, there are some parts of our university that require background checks to be in those educational uh, programs and they've been done for years. For example, almost everything in our BHS is and has been done, no questions asked, and there have been no problems with it. Um, on the other hand, we have groups of employees who have day-to-day -day interactions with students in ways that we have to be sure there isn't something that isn't, is in their background that we don't know about that would put us or the students in a very bad position going forward. So what we've done is to initiate um, a minimal level of background check we do it very quickly so it doesn't uh, impact the time to hiring. We don't do it in the initial screen. So it's not a check a box thing and you're out. It's only in the firing hiring, fire, final hiring. And is Vivian here today? She is not. Um, but I can refer you to her. All of this has been discussed extensively with the University Senate um, and with our faculty. Um, and we are doing exactly what we said we were going to do. So it's not, it's not opaque. I mean, you can find out what the reasons are, what the criteria are. I think the, the newest policy that was released, I, I was reading through that, and it's very vague in terms of just saying things that it eliminates what the university says is on. on um, well, there isn't one size fits all. I mean, what, what applies to one school or one program or one kind of job, we wouldn't want to necessarily apply to everyone because it would be too stringent and too um, invasive. So and we is have there just a way to make it more clear of what would eliminate people from certain jobs on campus and what, what I'm sure we could. I could have that conversation with Vivian. Again, there is, 
there, the, the, the challenge here and the goal is to minimize the risk to our populations and to the university by doing what is a fair and reasonable background check. It's not to be onerous and it's certainly not to exclude people who we feel don't fall into those categories and have paid their debt. I mean, we have these programs of teaching in the prisons and having incarcerated, formerly incarcerated individuals join our groups. So um, that's obviously not what we're here about. Senator Bob Boykus. Good Senator to see you. Boykus, Department of Chemistry. So uh, clearly, uh, negotiations are a hot topic here, and so I don't want I want to ask a question that's not about the details of contract negotiations. Now, as we all know, almost 20,000 faculty and staff at Rutgers have been working for three months on an expired contract, and apparently, the strategy that that we are encountering is absence of economic offers. Three months after the expiration of a contract, most of these unions have not gotten the remotest economic offer from management. And my, and my, my question is, how is this negotiation strategy, how is this negotiation strategy going to make Rutgers a great new university? Um, as you know, we've already settled with two unions, so the, 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 the wage offers that we can make are pretty public. Uh, we have had some uh, numbers put on the table by the uh, AUP uh, group, which are so out in the stratosphere somewhere that there's not even anything to discuss there. So somewhere in between there. Are you, are you going on record as saying that you refuse to negotiate over an economic offer that the union has made? I didn't say that. I, I thought I just heard you say that. And just, just for accuracy. Bob, I don't negotiate. I'm not at the negotiating table. I'm not responsible for the negotiation. I understand that. There's, an old saying, basis, so. there's some old saying about a fish that comes to yeah. mind. But in any event, the settlement with, with, with the fraternal order of police didn't announce the economic benefits, and it didn't mention the fact that that expired, contract expired in 2014. The negotiations of the Teamsters, who are not part of what you know is a, a broad union coalition. Is there a question here, Bob? No, I'm just correcting what you no, said. If there's a question, please ask it, but there's a long line behind it. Okay, my, my question is, can you give us an accurate description of what the settlement with the fraternal order of police was? I can't, but they can. Okay. All you have to do Who's is pick dead? up the phone and talk to the fraternal order of police. Is that these are public documents. They're going to be public when they're when they're ratified. So it has been. I ratified. don't have the right to do that. No. It was and I'm not going to negotiate contracts at the podium today. So you announced that this. settlement yesterday, and you refer to it today. It, there is a settlement. I'm telling you, it's out there. But I am not the union. I'm not the one that's going to make that announcement. So, so you don't know what the settlement was, in other words. Why don't you move on to the next question? Thank you, Senator. On my left, uh, Michael Vanstrom, uh, student senator representing the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge. Um, President Barsh, thank you as always for you always give us a really great cogent presentation and allow us to ask questions. Uh, I know that there's a lot of passion today here around uh, collective bargaining. But my question, I'd like to uh, make note of the fact that you thought enough of the issues of free speech and academic freedom to make that front and center in your presentation. Uh, here in the Senate, and our executive committee, we've wrestled with those issues, and um, your office shared with the executive committee a report that was done by the Office of Employment Equity surrounding a professor that had gotten a lot of public exposure. And in that report, and we, and also Vice President Lee gave us a copy of the book that you mentioned. Some of us have read it, and uh, she did ultimately compile that large amount of policies and procedures that we have uh, that you had mentioned when this came up before uh, that is very diverse and, and a little bit confusing. Uh, my question is, I, I know the committee, this uh, advisory group that's being created, is intended to be a scholarly group and um, is to provide a lot of guidance and guidance, but we, some of us notice that there isn't student representation on that advisory group. Would you consider a law school student of uh, proper credentials and qualifications to be on this group? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I said no, I wouldn't. Uh, the, the, the investigations 
interview students. Uh, they interview staff. They interview everybody else. What we've tried to do here are to get a small group of legal experts with deep experience at the national level in these issues. Deep experience at the national level. And that's the case for each and every one of the people on that committee, which incidentally has already been created and has already met. I do not believe that that is an appropriate place for a student participation because these are issues that deal with tenured faculty almost entirely. And uh, no, I wouldn't. Do you see a, a, a process or a pathway through which students can get some of their interests and concerns to this group? It's not the group that makes the decision. The group is simply advisory to the um, attorney, my, my general counsel. It's, um, it's the group that does the investigation under HR that actually does the investigation, does the interviewing, takes the information in. They may consult with this group if they feel it's necessary. Um, they may consult with general counsel if they feel it's necessary. The group doesn't make the decision. Okay. Um, good afternoon. HR. Thank you. Uh, Martha Soto presenting RBHS. Okay. Uh, President Barchi, uh, as a research faculty member at RBHS, I was so excited when you promised us uh, that administrative delays would be addressed by new procedures that you were going to put into place. And I know many changes have been made. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get what you said. Um, I'm a research faculty member at RBHS, and I was happy to hear that you were going to address administrative delays at Rutgers that delay research and that cost us ultimately money mm -hmm. and, and faculty who sometimes have been mm -hmm. in frustration. I'm a member of the Senate Budget and Finance Committee, and one of our charges is to look into um, IT decisions at Rutgers. So as you can imagine, even though our charge wasn't didn't have the word cornerstone in it, as we talk to people at Brown University about IT decisions at, at Rutgers, um, one thing that keeps coming up is, in fact, the switch that, that your group chose three years ago, the switch is over to uh, an enhanced program with, uh, called Cornerstone, made by Oracle Computers, that supplemented um, how we do travel, purchasing, uh, grants management, and, and, and so on. Um, Three years into its implementation, we keep getting emails every week that don't worry, this problem's going to be solved, that's problem going to be solved. I know everybody's working very hard. Our staff keep going to training sessions. I had to send a postdoc yesterday to a purchasing training session yesterday because purchasing has slowed down at RBHS. Um, we're very concerned. Uh, instead of making things better, right now it is eating up staff time. It's eating up faculty time, and it's even eating up graduate student and postdoc time. That should be going into research. So um, my specific question is, what are you and your staff doing to get at the root causes beyond the IT issues that are really create, creating problems for us with Cornerstone? Yeah. That's a very good question. And one that I'm happy to answer because I've personally taken direct responsibility and direct control of the SWAT team that was working with the research grant project. Um, first of all, when we talk about the, the improvements to the systems, you have to realize that systems didn't exist before. They were basically pushing paper, five different systems that didn't talk to each other, no organization there. So we were coming from a very deep place. Let's just take the research one, which has proven to be very difficult. Um, initially, people thought, well, it was a problem with conversion, this, that, and the other thing. When we actually dug into it, it turns out that we had 13,500 research grants that we had to go back and do individually, one at a time, by hand, because the data in the individual systems that have been put in there in the past was incorrect, incorrect. And you know, garbage in, garbage out. And that was the basic problem. So we had a full court press from the end of the spring until the summer to clear that. And I can tell you without reservation right now that every active grant in this institution has been scrubbed, has been gone over by hand, by the central offices sent to the departments, signed off on by the department and by the faculty, and is now correct and operable. So anybody who's running a research grant now, if they have a problem, they should give us a call and we'll figure out what they don't understand because the numbers are right and the process is right. If you look at purchasing, a mess, a total mess. People were going outside the system, they were setting up their own purchase orders, their own cards, um, the university was in a, an incredible position where we didn't even know what our balance due was on the purchasing side. So bringing us into a place where we have a common purchasing marketplace uh, where we can control the 
uh, accounting of expenditures is incredibly important for an operation our size. Secondly, there are major economies of scale to be garnered by doing that because we were not taking advantage of volumes, we were not taking advantage of rebates because we couldn't document any of that stuff. Now we can. Now we're going back to contractors and saying, well, you can renegotiate your contract or we'll move on to somebody else. And that's exactly what we're doing. In each of these areas, though, there have been, there's a, there's a hill to get over. First of all, you gotta figure out how bad was it before, and you don't realize that until you get in there and try to transfer everything and make it work. Um, and then how quickly can you get it out? Uh, the other thing that I've been a little disappointed with is the education process. We had built into this cornerstone implementation a lot of hours of um, faculty and staff education. Uh, and what I found when I started pushing on it last fall, last spring, I mean, was that education had not been taken advantage of. Or the people had done it, now they say, I don't remember. Um, we had to re-educate almost everybody in the research administrative staff. And if you're one of those, you know that we did that. We were literally sending SWAT teams into the departments to sit down with people and run them through the reports. We had problems with reports. We listened. We uh, generated could, reports that people wanted, and they're now in your hands. So um, I'm, I'm not a staffer. I'm a faculty member, oh, and okay. I'm spending a lot of time on, on Cornerstone. So when I talk to the staff, I do talk to the staff, say, why does it take me two months to post a position? They'll say, and these are two, staff that have been here 20 years, and they've gone through all these trainings. They'll say, they've added new steps, and there's fewer of us to do the same amount of work. Yeah. That's what's okay. slowing everything so, down. Let, let's take that one as an example. For one thing, the whole HR work stream is on the table for this year. We haven't even gotten to that yet. And we got to do all these things before we can fix student services, which is why we started this to begin with. So we haven't fixed all the HR things. We can't even get people to use the central systems that we have in place so we can document who you're hiring, what kind of offers you're making, and when you're doing it. The second thing is that we need to line up the salaries with the grants that are gonna pay them and the charges to those grants so that everything works efficiently. And right now, we still don't have all that information. So it is a slower process than it used to be. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that it will not be slower for all that much longer. Uh, it's a, look, look back, if you will, at the reimbursement issues that we had for our, um, you know, the very travel reimbursement and everything else. What a flurry of activity we had around that. Once everybody figured out that all you had to do is to, is to uh, do a nominal amount of work with your phone, the reimbursements go into your account within three or four days, suddenly I'm not getting any complaints about that at all. Well, that's the kind of up, you know, uploading process that will take place. This has been a huge process. I didn't talk about it at all. But if I had to talk about the hardest thing we've done here, it's not RBHS. It's not the integration. It's not the RWJB deal. It's not the Big Ten. It's the information systems in this university which were non-existent. And if you don't get them fixed, you're gonna be dead in the water. And the next guy that comes in here or lady that comes in here is not gonna be able to do anything. So I think we have a very thin staff, a very thin IT staff. They're working six, seven days a week to get this to happen. It's not clean. But I tell you, it is not just because of the IT staff, it's because of the huge mound of what we find under the rocks when we turn them over. I hope a year from now, we will have a, a different answer. Thank you. I think a year from now we'll be arguing about the student systems. Because it's an iterative process. President Bocci, the, the window we had agreed for your questions is, uh, is over. Can you give us a few more minutes? If so, how many? Uh, how about we take four more questions? Okay. Four oh, more questions oh. on my left, please. Hi, my name is Julie Serrano. I am a SES Senator for New Brunswick. Um, upon the retirement of there was a very highly qualified search committee established for finding a new chancellor, and they found the chancellor data. Um, and then a little, um, there's been a lot of commotion within the student population directly about the clashes and the conflicting visions for the future of the university, and why weren't these conflicting visions addressed by that very qualified search committee? And if you could clarify on what the conflicting visions are, because it's, it's very um, confusing for students. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, it's going to seem like I'm ducking this completely, but this is a personnel issue, and there are some things I can comment on and some things I can't. 
So a lot of the specifics I simply can't comment on. Um, one would hope, first of all, back up a little bit. The situation that we were recruiting to, a chancellor for New Brunswick, was a very unusual and complicated one. I don't think there's another university in the country that has a chancellor for New Brunswick that has the job description that we have. And that's because of the way the law was written for higher education reform in Trenton by people who did not understand higher education, who did not really realize what they were doing, who out of whole cloth created four chancellor's positions that didn't exist and five provost positions that didn't exist, which we had to fill by law and specified who those chancellors could or could not be in our hierarchy. So, for example, we have a chancellor from New Brunswick who somebody from the outside might assume is the president of the AAU University. Well, that's not the case here. It wasn't the case then, it's not the case now, it hasn't been the case since the, um, the legislation was written. Um, so there are lots of areas for confusion. We tried our best to make everyone aware of that uh, and to um, explain that to candidates who came through, certainly explained it to the search committee. It's totally contained in the documents that we put on in the job description. Um, but it is a potential source for, for um, disagreement and for conflict. And I must say that um, Dr. De uh, Deba Dura uh, did an outstanding job uh, for the year he was here and recognized the difference in his vision in the university's legislative vision and made a decision to do what he did. I, I'm wholly in support of him doing that uh, and I'm supportive of him. I, I am now. He's one of our senior faculty members and I would wholeheartedly support him looking for a, a, a president's job at some institution. Um, but there was a disconnect between our uh, his desires of where he wanted to go and the university's statutes. Was that not a part of the application process? I, I'm, I really can't tell you any more than that. Okay, thank okay. you. I think I've been maybe even more Senator than Thompson. I can. Karen. Yes, hi Bob. Uh, so this is Senator <laughs> Senator Thompson, Senator. Yeah. Uh, we know. Uh, Karen Thompson, Senator for New Brunswick PTLs. And first... <laughs> That's, that just reflects 40 years of service. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I thank you for your presentation. There were so many interesting things that I'd like to respond to, but I'm going to have to limit myself because I hope everybody gets a chance to ask their question. You started out by pointing out how everything is increasing, has been increasing in, in the last six years, but you know that PTLs are still undercompensated That's without right. any health care. <laughs> And unpaid for service, like I'm performing right now, even though the Senate unanimously recommended last spring that we be compensated for such service. Anyways, you also mentioned free speech. I don't see how there could be free speech for PTLs when they're appointed semester by semester. But it might be your intent that they have free speech but the, the actuality is different. Um, I happened to step out of the room for a minute, so I miss, missed all the numbers that you presented. I'm confident, though, that they had nothing to do with PTLs. The last thing that you, the last thing you mentioned uh, that I noted was about the best faculty that we're developing, yet e even as we develop this best faculty, the percentage of the faculty that is PTLs has been growing really rapidly. I know you know that. So let me get to the question. My question is, when PTLs teach such a large percentage of courses and of the student body uh, at Rutgers, why are their concerns so far to the bottom of the list right. of priorities? Karen, Karen and I have had this conversation, and actually, uh, she and I are not that far apart in, in many of our feelings. Uh, there are a couple of things that she is absolutely right about. Uh, one is that the percentage of PTLs at Rutgers has grown dramatically over the last 15 years in a way that makes Rutgers unlike any of our peers. Uh, we're at the bottom of the peers. No, we're the other way, Karen. We have, we have more PTLs by 
by 50 or 75 percent than any of our peer groups. Um, and of course, if you talk to the tenured faculty, the net result is that we have fewer tenured faculty than any of our peer groups. So somewhere along the line, there was a conscious decision to shift from one form to another. And I'd love to go into the numbers with you, but I can't do that until we finish these negotiations. And then I will do it. So here's the, here's the deal, Karen. You and I know that PTLs are not a homogeneous group. We've done the research, we've done it in depth. Um, there, there is a, a spectrum, it's actually a bimodal distribution of faculty like you, who are by choice PTLs, teach multiple courses for multiple years. And then there's another very large cadre of individuals who are in for one year or one semester. Um, and we not, it's not one size fits all. I'm sorry, let me answer my, the question, all right? And I, I think there are very serious questions that we have to have with you, with the NTTs and the tenured faculty about how we want the university to look in the future and then how we get there. So the one thing we did bite off before the contract uh, negotiations came up was to create upward paths for NTTs. And in terms of uh, career tracks and, and uh, title ladders and all those things. Um, I don't think that's inappropriate to think about for PTLs if we can define who we're doing it for and how we're doing it. But we have to do that. So you know I'm committed to that because I've already told you that. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I, I look forward to seeing what happens at the bargaining table, but I would just like to point out that no, none of our groups are homogeneous, right? The, the, we want a, a, a diverse faculty, we want a diverse student body, and so PTLs are a diverse group too. I'm not talking about diversity. I'm talking about employment. And if somebody is here and knows they're gonna be here to teach one course, that may not put them in the same category as someone like you who's teaching four courses a semester for 30 years. So, next, next question, I'm gonna to have to leave now. Go ahead. How that compares to your salary? Yeah. Yeah! I know the exact number. Do you? Please just make the question. My name is Emily Payne. I'm a senator from New Brunswick. I'm a student. My question is regarding the proposed search committee for a new uh, chancellor. I would like to know what that process looks like right now. Um, like, is the search committee already assembled? Is it being put together? And would you consider having student representation on that search committee? Um, so let me say, first of all, there is no process for a search committee for a new chancellor. I have not put one in place. Uh, if and when the time comes to search for a new chancellor, there absolutely would be student representation, as there has been for every one of these in the past. Uh, but right now, uh, we're just settling down. We're just seeing how we're going, and we'll take things as they go for the next few months. So there is not a search committee. Okay? Thank you. Senator on my right. Hello, President Barcher. My name is Mihardla Garibald. I am an SAS senator from New Brunswick. Um, I stand in proud solidarity with the faculty union behind me. Um, my question pertains to wage on campus. I am a full-time student. I have I take very credit-intensive major. I work 18 and a half hours a week, over an hour away, because none of the on-campus jobs will pay me enough to pay my rent and my living expenses. I am expected to support myself as. As, a, as though I earn a full-time wage on a part-time salary, and I'm also expected to get good grades and graduate. If you and your administration are so adamant to raise the minimum wage to $15, what else concretely are you doing to support your students, your population of students, that can't afford to continue living like this? Well, I think I showed you, and you can, I refer you to the report, to all the things that we are doing. Uh, to provide as much financial aid as we can to increase the, uh, the wage for our uh, student workers, uh, to increase the dollars coming from the state, to help redirect dollars from the trustees and other organizations to financial aid for students. President Barchi, when over 247 of your administrators are being paid over a quarter of a million dollars a year, how can you not afford to pay your student workers a livable wage? I'm not going to answer the question. Do you want to come over? Okay. All the no, I, I answered the question. You did Senator, 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 Senator,
Uh, we had agreed there that we would take an hour of uh, President Bachi's time today. He's given us two hours. So please join me in thanking him for spending did, oh, time with you us asked today. Me if I wanted to speak. There will be opportunities for other questions I was asked at other if I wanted meetings. To speak. I was asked if I wanted to speak.